Business is simple. It's just not easy. We focus on three things to help you run and grow your business more easily. Talent, sales, and how to scale. This is the Talent, Sales, and Scale Show. Hey everyone, oh my gosh, strap yourself in. We got Will Kern here today. He is the founder, Chief Event Einstein, whatever in the world that means, of Endless <laughs> Events. And I'll tell you what, Will and I had a conversation. He brings so much energy. Um, strap yourself in. This should be a fun ride. So welcome, Will. Thanks so much, Brian, for having me. I'm uh, stoked to be here. And uh, I, I would definitely like to think I bring the energy for sure. So strap in for sure. <laughs> you know, let's get it. So and I'll tell you, that he has to be energy uh, because he's the chief event Einstein. He's hosting of Event Brew. He's hosting Event Tech Podcast. And then another one, Event Icons. And my gosh, you name it, he's doing it. So he's got tons and tons of content. So we're excited to have him here. And the topic of today, everyone, is, listen, we thought we we're going to be out. We, yeah, we can go to some different events but even whenever you go to events so I was just at one on uh, Wednesday yesterday and we're getting lower attendance and so this virtual events is still a thing it's something that we should still be thinking about bringing into our portfolio of prospecting uh, and in in marketing so I'm really excited to have will Kern on here for that topic and and so I guess with that as the backdrop will let me ask you a super easy question. <laughs> yeah, you do all of these events. Yeah, you do all these podcasts. So, so why? Why should we listen to you on this one? <laughs> well, um, definitely feel free to look me up on LinkedIn to see my credentials for sure. If you ever, if you're ever doubting me in any sort of way, no, I'm just kidding. But I, I I've been doing events for close to 15 years now. I started my uh, endless events when I was in high school um, and basically always in the pursuit of taking complex things and making them simple. Um, that's been endless's goal. We call it creating the equation. The idea that like, you know, you've, you've heard of the term relativity, but you probably have no idea what the heck that even means, but you've heard of equals MC squared. And so it's the idea that we create the equation similar to Einstein, the way he did that and make it super duper simple. And yeah, when it comes to, to, to digital uh, events, virtual events, in person person events and hybrid events, which is where the future is going, this kind of a hybrid between virtual and in-person. Um, I've been producing hybrid events and in-person events, yeah, since high school, basically my entire life. And uh, what's been really cool is that we, over time, have found that you know content marketing, digital marketing is the wave of the future. It's the way I buy everything. I'm sure everyone out there knows that. Inbound is the way to go. And what we found is the success of this is that we became thought leaders in what we do. We realized that people actually listen to us. So now we're third highest trafficked website in the events industry, might be approaching number two now. I got to check in on that uh, nice. real soon. Um, and, you know, I probably speak at every single conference in the events industry, conferences outside the events industry on the future of events. Um, and yeah, when we, um, when the pandemic kind of broke out, while most event companies kind of like were furloughing and contracting, we actually saw explosive growth. We grew by over 250%, something like that, maybe 300%. Uh, year over year, uh, still so busy right now that we're working on that growth. Um, so, you know, we have just been very lucky that when the pandemic broke out and people are looking for the, the team to help them execute these virtual events and for them to figure out how can I, you know, stay in front of my customers? How can I engage my employees? How can I create a conference that I've done in person for years to turn it virtually? We basically take care of everything for them. All the technology, all the production, all the creative, all the strategy. That's essentially what we do. So yeah, it's uh, it's been a fun, wild ride and excited to be here. But interesting. Uh, so from that, I, w I have a couple of questions that came off of this. So I never considered an event to be an inbound approach. So unpack that a little bit because that's the last, I was expect last thing I was expecting to hear. Definitely, definitely. So for me, like when it comes to events, I consider a virtual or a digital event to be part of your marketing stack. Uh, similar way that you use HubSpot or you use, uh, you know, MailChimp or you use Facebook ads to drive people or you have a blog or, you know, whatever it may be. I consider it an asset that you're going to be creating and a channel that you're going to be using to communicate to your customers or your employee, whatever audience that you have. Virtual events are great for this stuff. And so I think a lot of ways when you're looking at the people that are having the most success are the ones who think in that same way. And we'll probably talk a little bit about exhibitors and people who are attending these virtual events and maybe you're sponsoring 
doing a virtual event. But very much so, it should just be considered an asset and a stack that you're including as part of your inbound methodology to, again, drive traffic back to your blog or your website to, to for, or its content offers. It's, it's all the same stuff we've been talking about for years. It's just instead of us doing webinars on our website or doing a web, guest webinar, now instead you're creating a whole event with lots of content. And, uh, and what I think most people are realizing is a lot of more work that goes into it. So I'm going to go down the content path in a second, but I want to come back and, and lay it out. Okay, so we get to an event show. And one of the things that you ask yourself whenever we do an event or, or in-person event, right? Do you exhibit or do you walk the floor, right? Because mm, yeah. really it's, it's a bunch of meeting places. So let me go to the virtual exhibitors. I hadn't even really thought through that um, too much. I just thought it was a whole bunch of people coming on board and just having breakout rooms and stuff like that. So talk yeah. to me a little bit about those, th those exhibitors. One, what should they be doing as an exhibitor? And two, if I'm trying to sell a show like this, what do I tell them to do to get additional, because you can get revenue off of this and all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff. So unpack that a little bit. Totally. Well, I think one of the things is, and I mean this lightly because I think it's a little bit more complex than this, but just to ease everybody into it. So I think when you think about a virtual event, you need to think about it in the same way you'd plan an in-person event. If you're thinking you're going to have a virtual event on Zoom and you're just going to have, you know, push everyone to breakout rooms and then bring everybody back for a general session, and push, well, that, you know, that's kind of like, a digital virtual event that was acceptable in March 2020 when we were first getting out everyone was trying to figure this out but people are craving deeper experiences they're craving the ability to go in and out they're craving the ability to see the profiles of the people that they're meeting right they're they're craving this idea of alternative content not just hearing people talk at them they're looking for you know walking meetings where they can listen to a a, a presentation or a panel while they're going for a walk right and they're looking for an experience so that's one of the first things i think when it comes to designing this entire event well, when it comes to the idea of exhibiting at them, I think that far too many people really expect that they can just throw up a profile and hope to God that business comes to their way, right? It's kind of like the idea of like, I'll get a Yelp listing and then all of a sudden I'll start getting lots of people coming my way. Doesn't work that way, right? So for anybody who's looking at exhibiting, my best suggestion is for you to think about this the same way you think about digital marketing. If right now digital marketing to you is Facebook ads and, um, you know, pr promoting people just to your website or trying to only rank some weird, you don't understand SEO and things like that. You probably need to learn more about digital marketing and how to do this. But if you're already doing things like, for example, you have a blog post that you're or blogs that you're publishing five, six times a week. If you're, you know, finding ways to create an engaging newsletter, that's as good as morning brew. If you're, um, you know, finding ways to build community inside of a Facebook group so people can ask each other questions and you can help your customers out. If you're trying to find ways to create engaging webinars that are controversial and get people thinking, if you're creating these beautiful eBooks that are well-designed and well thought out and have research backed that you've collected, right? You're going to ace this stuff and you're going to crush it. Um, I think that a lot of the companies Companies that are being successful in exhibiting are the ones who are thinking about it in the way of digital marketing. Um, in fact, to kind of pivot into the, the, the conversation of anyone who's hosting, this is my like super controversial opinion. And I'm sure someone's listening right now who's like gold platinum sponsor of some event right now. And they've you know, put 100,000, 200,000, lots of money behind it. And maybe they did the in-person event before and they loved it because their ideal customer was there because they were the platinum sponsor, they got the most amount of attention. They actually closed business on the show floor. And then they transitioned into virtual and they were like angry at the organizer. Why the heck am I not getting leads? Where's my business? How come you're not work? You know, right. All these things like that. And this terrifies event planners, by the way, F planners right now are like, how can I drive more value for my exhibitors? But in reality, then you have these spot, these uh, exhibitors and sponsors who are like the like low tier guys. And, you know, maybe part of what they're trying to do is uh, one of the assets that they give for uh, being able to be a sponsor is you get to lead a session. Well, it turns out that le leaded session, that breakout room, that was supposed to be really small and be the most popular session, the most high highest rated session. In fact, once they did the session, they also handed out eBooks with lots more resources. They drove a lot of leads back to their website. They, you know, their entire staff was engaging and throughout the entire time, even attending competitor panels and helping them engage inside of it. Everybody knew about that sponsor and was like, we love that sponsor, but they were not the ones who are giving the most amount of money. The difference is that you have this old school mentality with exhibitors who are expecting, I show up, I give you money, you give me leads. That doesn't work anymore. Instead, you need to put value 
as a sponsor back into the conference. So I think the thing to think about when it comes to these exhibitors or these planners is if you're planning this and having exhibitors, this is my controversial opinion, I think you need to tell the sponsor who's putting a quarter million dollars, a half, what, your gold platinum sponsor who's pissed at you because they're not getting the value they see anymore that they used to get in person, offer them a lower tier. Offer them the silver package, the smaller one. Say, look, I know you're not getting as much value from this. You don't quite get, I think, digital marketing. We obviously figure out a nice way to say that. Yeah. And you say, hey, I, I don't think you're quite getting this. I, I think that instead of spending so much money with us, so you're not as angry, uh, do a little smaller package. Expectation, bring the expectations a lot lower. But take that one, the person who's crushing it, who gave the best session, who's, who's you know, adding value, who's not spamming the attendees and going and messaging every person and hope to God that they get leads. Instead, take that person and say, hey, I think you're getting a lot of value from this. Why don't you become our, you know, you don't have to necessarily jump straight to the platinum top tier, but like, hey, why don't you become a gold sponsor? Why don't you spend a little bit more money with us? Flip the script and take the sponsors and exhibitors who are getting it, who get digital marketing, who post on the blogs every day, who create ebooks, who create engaging webinars that just give it all away for free. Make those your sponsors because those are the people who are helping create an amazing experience for your attendees. But when you take that sponsor who's going to spam the crap out of everybody and expect to get lots of leads, you're setting an expectation for your attendees that that's what the kind of behavior you want to reward as well. And that creates a really dangerous experience, I think. Okay, so I'm going to, I have two ways that I want to take this. So I'm going to try to pull this together. Way number one is it sounds like if you're just thinking about doing this and you don't have a whole entire digital footprint, you don't have that strategy laid out, don't even think about it. Mm, mm. Is that right? I, I think that uh, the controversial side of me wants to like pick a polar side of it and say yes. Um, and I think the thing is that if you're going to do it, I think more so probably the best answer is caution. Put on the caution lights. Start to say, is this going to be the best thing that needs to be done? Because I think so many people are expecting that you're going to, you know, you get the value that you put the money into. The money isn't what creates the value for you. It's about the interaction, the engagement that you get. Um, and, you know, you mentioned a little bit like the, the deciding whether to exhibit or walking the show floor, right? I've been more of a fan of, hey, I think sometimes you can generate just as much value walking the show floor. But where I think the difference is, is that digital events, where they thrive is content. The content is the best format ever, right? Like we used to go to conferences and you go and sit and watch someone talk. It, yeah, it's great, but you're sitting in a room, you're uncomfortable. But now you can like put it up on the big screen, be at home with your favorite snacks. You, it's a, content's delivered the best way through virtual events. But the in-person events, the best thing that's about them is the interaction that you have with people. Well, because the content's so important, I think it's very important that you're delivering incredible content. And I think that's how you're gonna get the best leads. In fact, I'll share a secret with everyone. Hopefully none of my competitors are listening, but I've always found so much value in doing guest webinars, guest podcasts, because I just give so much value. And then what I do is along the way, I sprinkle in, check out our ebook, check out our calculator that helps support what I'm talking about, gives you more resources. And we get so many leads that way. And I do it all for free in the expectation that, hey, someone's going to download the content offer and then I'll put them in my inbound funnel and it works out well. And it's crushed it way more than I've ever sponsored. I sponsored events. I've like literally paid to do someone's entire event for them. And I get hardly as many leads as when I go out there and just dump value for everybody in terms of content, great presentations and everything like that. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to con because the, the topic today, right? And if you're not getting anything out of this, here's the key, content, content, content. It's how can I uh, repurpose this? Because the beauty is whenever you do long form like this, and this is likely one of the reasons that Will is doing this, you do a long form content like this, 30, 60 minutes, and then you have snippet after snippet and, and topic after topic and, and lead generator off of this. And that's the real power at doing these things. So let, let's definitely hit on that. But let's give some hope to little old small business owner, right? I got a couple of people and I have dreams and aspirations and I aspire to, to do these things. What's maybe the couple of key steps? Like what's the building blocks to go from I'm just starting down the digital content path. I barely have my website up to where they can capture leads. I'm mm -hmm. blogging once a month. How do we go from that, no real content creation, to where I know I can now be ready to do these virtual events? Absolutely. So um, if you're looking at kind of like stepping into this, I think, you know, and it's funny, I think HubSpot, when I signed up for HubSpot the first time, this was the first content offer they suggest you make, which is a consultative content offer. The idea like, hey, create a landing page, Give away 30 minutes of your time for anyone to talk to you to get help, 
right? And when I people hear consultation now, I I'm really sad because I think the sales world, as usual, usually ruins everything, right? We um, ruined it, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> is that like sales people are like, well, you can call our sales meeting consultations, and then we'll just push product down their yeah, throats, we'll and now people world. are like. People are like, oh, I don't want to go to a consultation. You're just going to sell to me, right? Well, true a true consultation. Offer people free time because as the business owner, you understand your space better than anybody at all. So what, here's a really simple content path. It doesn't take any money or time to be able to do this. You can do it with all reasons. You don't even need HubSpot or fancy software to do this. Is go to the, the conferences and offer to speak at them to get your foot wet maybe you know if they say you know we're not looking for speakers say hey what do i have to can i sponsor uh, become a, like an entry-level sponsor to be able to get a session your audience is exactly who i'm looking to get in front of i can really add value me as the owner of the company i've been doing this for 25 30 years whatever it is i can add a lot of value so obviously go do the speaking engagement and have a great presentation don't sell product just give away the farm tell them all your secrets no one's ever gonna copy you so let me, let me pause you there because that's a, that's a massive transformation because in the old days, um, it was hold on to your IP. Don't give the IP. There's one training organization out there that says, you know, don't spill your candy in the lobby. You don't want to give that information out. Yeah. Even they have transformed that and they're giving content away all the time. So what would you say to the persons like, oh, that's, that's my IP or that's, that's uh, you know, the, my competition will figure this out. What do you say to that person? I've been doing this for... 15 years and I've been telling everybody everything I do. Like I jokingly say like, oh, hopefully one of my competitors are listening to this. But honestly, if one of my competitors is listening to this, good luck. I give you a thumbs up. Good luck trying to copy my strategy and do it. I think far too often we over like value what we're capable of doing. Yeah, if you found out the cure of cancer and you want to turn it into IP and things like that, great for you. But most of the time what we're doing isn't the cure for cancer. It's, it's pretty much not rocket science. It's about the delivery and how you do it. This idea of inbound marketing isn't new. I, in fact, a lot of my strategies come from copying what other people do and, you know, uh, doing exactly what it is, but yet no one's ever been able to surpass endless in terms of us being the third highest trafficked website in the events industry. Right. Um, and, and granted the, the top two are gigantic publications in the events industry, So that's why they get more traffic. So all their job is to do is to drive traffic. Right. Yeah. My job is to actually do events. So, <laughs> um, I think what you can't overvalue what you're capable of doing, but also too. Most of the time, your competitors aren't even in the room when this happens. I've actually had it where competitors, executives of competitors have come in. But what's funny is like, I jokingly say one of my largest competitors, I once was speaking at a conference. It was like giving away the farm. I was like the head key key keynote speaker. The CEO never even came into my talk. He didn't care who I was. He didn't have any idea. And that's, I think, one of the best things about inbound marketing is that you're not going over here blasting yourself on uh, on these things. You're not trying to sneak your way into a specific conference room to try to meet with people. You're just giving so much more helpful information to everybody. So, um, so yeah, so if you're worried mm -hmm. about giving away the farm, don't. Just go out and do it. I can tell you, I've been doing it for 15 years, never had a problem. People try to copy you but they'll never be able to do it as well as you if you're serious about it. Yeah, and, so. I, and I think another way is looking at that mindset. Do you have a scarcity mindset or an abundance mindset? And you seem sure. willing to have that abundance mindset because I don't know, Will, could you and your company handle all of the events possible out there or do you, maybe you need your competitor to win a couple or two? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, 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 and with that, that same thought process too is that like what I've realized is that when you end up creating a thought leadership position in the industry, it's actually the opposite of what ends up happening. Your competitors actually look up to you and they actually say like, oh my gosh, I love everything you do. And they talk highly about you. And isn't that the goal ultimately is you want your competitors saying like when they lose the business to you, they go, oh man, that, yeah, that endless company is great. I really, you're going to have a good time, right? And the, I goes, oh my gosh, wow, I can't believe they said nice things about it. So so I think back to like the how you continue on this, like what does this content path kind of look like and how can you do this easily? Do a great presentation, give away the farm, give away great information, and and you're gonna kill it. People are gonna come you want the goal that people are coming up to you saying, Oh my gosh, I was so valuable. You want to get nines and tens on your presentations. If you're getting, you know, poor reviews on your presentation, you gotta work on your presentation skills. That's probably the first thing. And honestly, if you own a business, you gotta be good at this anyways, right? Um, or if you don't have, if you're not good at it, you have to have someone on your team that does it, right? Yeah. So start with that. And then what's going to happen is you start giving away good information. Now you're like, well, how do I turn this into actual revenue? How do I not just turn people into making me a good speaker? How do I just not turn myself into a professional speaker basically at this point? How do I That's generate a and for me, it's, it's, you know, I have eBooks and I, have, I give out like a, like a, a long list of links at the end of my presentation where I say like, here, check out this eBook, check out this, right? And those are all gated with forms. You have to give me your phone number and email address, right? And then a sales job, but a lot, that's really complicating for most people. 
but turn it into this offer. Anybody that comes up to you and, and offer to them and say, look, if you found this valuable, which if you've given so much good information, they're going to find this valuable. They're going to want time on your calendar. They're going to say, can I pick your brain for 30 minutes? That's the consultation you want to have. I want to pick your brain. Don't sell. Just give them value for 30 minutes. Give, you know, all this value. And at the end, if they're like, you ask them, hey, well, did you find this valuable? And they're like, yeah, this was so good. I got so much value from your talk. And now this 30 minutes has been so good. Hopefully at that point too, you've kind of qualified them a little bit too. You've asked them some questions to find out whether they have, do they have budget? Do they have authority? Do they have need? Do they have timing, right? Are they a good customer for you? And chances are once you've given away that free value and you say to them, well, cool. I'm really glad you found value in it. You know, I, I really think that I can help you with what your challenges is. You're asking me about it. Obviously, I know a lot about it. Would you be open to the idea of us working there? Maybe I can help you a little bit more. Most people will say, yes, I'm at least open to that conversation. Now that's a conversation of how do you sell and how do you close the deal and all those things like that. But I've just taught you how you can take a speaking engagement and turn it into a consultation that then turns into a potential opportunity for you. And it, so that took... I not, didn't need landing pages, didn't need HubSpot, didn't need any of that. That was just simply, hey, give me your card. You follow up with an email, follow up with a phone call, do the consultation, and then add value. So here's where we'll, we'll screw up this. <laughs> we'll screw up the tactic you just gave us, right? All right, salespeople, here you go. No longer are you going to offer 30-minute consultations. <laughs> it's now 30 minutes, pick my brain. Because it, what yeah. you've done there, Will, it, it's really rather quite genius or Einstein-ish, if you will. Uh, it's... You know, you're now, um, why do people want to do business with us? It's not because of your pitch. It's not because of anything other than they trust you to be able to solve the problem. So really what Will is doing here is by giving this amazing content away, by giving all of this information, if it's this good for free, and I sure as heck know that I can't do this, yeah, I'm going to hire you. And then further, if you take that and then say, listen, Pick my brain, 30 minutes, ask me whatever you want. And then you're asking clarifying question, which, oh, by the way, that's what you do on sales is uncover the root cause problem and determine whether or not you can help them. Pick my brain for 30 minutes. You're going to have those, those uh, clarifying questions within there. And then after that, then you say, listen, based upon everything you said, we'll lay it out the exact language to use for goodness sakes, you to rip off his language, oh, wait, repurpose his language and, and just do that. Um, and you're good to go. So I, I love all of that. So that's how somebody brand new without the landing pages, without all of this content, if they can deliver a good, valuable speech and then, you know, just chuck down a couple of ideas, a checklist for goodness sakes, that's what your giveaway can be. And then you can tap me for 30 minutes of my time. Is it seriously that easy for people, Will? Totally, totally. And, and like, if you're, if you're thinking to yourself like, okay, well, I'm not seeing a lot of value. People are afraid of these consultations. Well then think about something you can give them for free. I'm not talking about like a pen or like a tchotchke. Think about like a resources that builds on what you talk about. So like what I've seen a lot of success is I'll give a presentation on, let's say for example, uh, how to budget for your virtual event. You've never planned one for how much does this all cost? I'm going to tell you how to do all that stuff. But at the end I'm all, or the end or in the middle, sometimes at the beginning, I just like say, I'm going to do this. I'll give you a calculator. It's a spreadsheet that I use to calculate how much the entire budget is. And it's going to give you all the information you need. The only thing that I ask is, Hey, can you, and this is the kind of pro tip for in-person conversations. If you're doing a webinar, it's even easier. You literally just drop the link in the chat and say, click it now, click it now, click it now. But like in person, the, 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 the transition is, Hey, just drop your card. I'm gonna send you one email. And that's one of the most important things I think I saw of this is when I started doing this, people freaked out when I put them on sequences where I try to fall, I say, I'm going to send you one email. It's going to have all the links, all the resources I mentioned. And if you don't have resources or links or things like that, or you only have one, Sprinkle in some third party ones, maybe not your competitors necessarily, but maybe for example, if you have a news article that explains the future yeah. of whatever your industry is, say, hey, I'm going to send all these links to you. Just give me your card. I'll send one email. I send one email and I expect them to then download that piece of content. I gate it. Then they give me their information and that's their opt in to say, Hey, I want to be followed up by a SDR or sales development rep, um, from there. But, um, you know, definitely it's one of the things that's like, I found is that my whole marketing strategy is just give value, give value, give value, and people will want in return. And I think that's why virtual events can be super duper productive is that the, the, the brands that I think are crushing it and doing virtual events really, really well are going out there and spending lots of money to build a lot of value in the expectation that, look, 
it's going to work out. The karma is going to work out in the end. We'll drive leads that way. Um, you know, you look at, for example, obviously HubSpot's a great example because they're the inbound kings. They are inbound conference co is crushing it. I look at a brand called Trainial. They're doing really, really well on this too. Their brand's really, really tight um, and they're doing virtual events as well. Just look at the people who events that you're going to and that you found lots of value in and you're going to see that you're building so much more trust with them and they're not sitting here, you know, saying, oh, you have to talk to a sales rep before you can attend our conference, before you can talk to our, no, just come and give the value away for free. Yeah. Now, um, you talked about alternative content. I think that was a language that you used. I wrote that note down. I've not heard that that phrase before. Talk to me what that means, please. Yeah. So like, I think everyone's used to the kind of straightforward content, blog posts, webinars, eBooks, podcasts, but in reality, the alternative content that you can sometimes create is things like calculators. Um, for example, creating a spreadsheet that, that, that literally calculates what they need on it. And, and, and Grant, sometimes this sounds really complicated. You're like, I don't know how I'm going to make this. Start off really simple. Sometimes you'd be surprised how little – like you are so good at what you do. If you just put 5% of effort into building something, it's going to be amazing. Like for example, one of my favorite things is we were trying – we are like, we need to create a – we get kept asking for a, an event planning budget template. And we're like, my gosh, there's just so much to budget for. There's so many line items. We're just like – we're just – there's no way we're ever going to be able to make this. It's not going to be perfect. And then I guess it's like, you know, you guys put out like a – put out a spreadsheet that has ticket sales, number of people, um, creates total revenue – a line to say how much sponsorship you got and then expenses was like food and beverage av <laughs> i think lodging or something like that and it's like and just did a simple math formula that was income minus expenses equals profit uh, people loved it and they were like this is so helpful thank you so much <laughs> and i was like oh my and obviously we improved it over time because we once you get the the experienced people they'll start you know giving you feedback and saying yeah. we want something better but um, you know, I think calculators are really, really helpful. I think so. Also, let me let me just pause you yeah. there. Think of the think also as of this calculator. But notice what he did. You can get paralyzed by perfection. Perfection is for for foolish people. You were never going to be perfect. Eighty percent is good enough. Get it good enough. Get the feedback. That minimal viable product, and then attack it. Find the problem and attack it. So take that away, please. Keep going. Well, you were saying uh, other than yeah. calculators. Yeah, I mean, so calculators is an example of one, but. I'll kind of pivot the conversation. I know pivots like the song, the thing you say when you have to drink. Um, but <laughs> um, I'll, I'll pivot a little bit too to think about this a little bit differently too. Is that you're going to do this presentation and you're going to give this amazing talk, right? One of the best things, and this is why virtual events are great, because they you always have a camera on you and they're usually recording it because they want to you know share it afterwards and things like that. In person events, you have to spend a lot of AV money to do that sort of thing. So this is why virtual events are killer. Is that you're going to do this awesome talk? They're going to record it. And the best thing you can do is to grab that recording afterwards and repurpose it. You said the word repurpose, and this is what kind of inspired me, is that far too often do we sit here and say, I'm going to make a blog post, and it just dies on the vine. Yeah. But, or I'm going to do a webinar, and just it's a webinar, and that's it. But always take whatever content that you create. If you're a small man team, or even if you're a big person team, we do this, and we have a gigantic team in order to support us, is that we take every piece of content and becomes five, six other pieces of content. So take your speaking engagement. Chop it up. Turn it into a five-minute video where your best key point is right there. Upload that to your YouTube channel. Hey, take the entire talk. Give it to a writer and say, hey, I want you to summarize this entire talk. Turn it into a 10,000-word blog post, right, and let them you know, add a little bit of spin to it. Take the, the talk. Take like five-second quote that you have. That's just incredible. Turn it into a social media post, right? We know social media right now is really crushing it in terms of video content. And then you ha now you've turned that one talk into uh, – you know, oh, and here's another one. Take the talk, convert it to audio, upload it as a podcast, right? And boom, now you're taking this piece of content and it just became like 5, 10, 15 pieces of content right then and there. And it's making sure so you do less effort. And the best part about this is you make all these pieces of content, the, you know, the, the social media posts and things like that. Drive them all back to the website. So, for example, take this five-second social media clip with a video and then point it and say, hey, you want to learn more? Go to the blog post. And on the blog post, you have this long explanation and say, hey, if you want to get um, the ebook version of this or you want to subscribe to our podcast where we talk more about this, boom. And that's basically how you can make a really simple content funnel with one single piece of content. Yeah. And, and so talk to the person that feels overwhelmed. Like, I don't even know where to start. Yeah. Uh, well, it it's not going to be perfect, right? Like the one <laughs> I would love to show you, you probably can. There's a website called the waybackmachine.com. You can go on there, type in helloendless.com and look at what we used to look like. 
this will give you inspiration for what we look like. When we first started, we were publishing one blog post a month, maybe, maybe if we're lucky, we for, would do it, you know, twice a month, you know, and it starts slow and you start to figure out what works and what you want, right? Then you start to just slowly take, uh, you know, effort. For example, when we got HubSpot, first offer we did was that consultation offer. Very shortly afterwards, we just were like, well, we need like a physical piece of content. I don't think people really want consultations right now, right? We're, we didn't know how to quite do it the right way. And we didn't have authority. So who the heck wanted a consultation from these random company that was just barely getting its foot in the door? So we did, we made an infographic. I literally, uh, I think uh, I, I had a graphic designer. I said, look, I want to explain what some of these elements are on the stage, what that light is, what that speaker does and things like that. Hey, take this picture, turn it into a graphic. And then I told them, I said, okay, that's a line array speaker. For example, I'm getting nerdy for all the event folks. <laughs> and what we did is we built that thing. And I was like, you know, this is normally something you just post on a blog post. Well, we gated it. We put it behind a landing page with a form and things like that. And the stuff is really easy to make with HubSpot's free tools. There's other p tools out there that do that. And I, I'm a huge HubSpot nerd. So I apologize for anyone who's like, is there anything other than HubSpot? Just Google like landing page tool, right? And so we gated it and we put it behind a, a form. People actually don't wanted to give their contact version to get this, right? And it worked really, really well. And honestly, it probably was maybe a couple hours worth of work, right? And I didn't do the graphic design. I had someone else do it. Um, you know, and the landing page was really easy too. It's like a drag and drop tool. It's gotten so much easier now. So I think the one thing to think in mind is that you're going to look at some of these brands who are like coming in 4K, high quality cinematic videos, and man, their webinars are so polished. They have Shaq as a, a guest speaker on their con you know their thing, and oh my gosh, their podcast has had 200 episodes. How am I going to be like? Just start and make your first step on it. Good. Another example of this event icons we talked about was one of the podcasts that I started. Uh, it was basically my chance to interview icons in the events industry. I had no idea it was going to grow as big as it is now. And it was just kind of my chance to play with the platform. It was very similar to Zoom. It put four people on screen side by side. I just hit record and I uploaded it. I didn't edit it in any sort of way. I just uploaded it. And if you watch those videos, I didn't have this nice podcast mic. You know, I literally had iPod headphones, probably like similar headphones you have in right now. And that was it. Yep. And that was just how I did the show. And what I did realize is it was about consistency. And now I think we're four years later of doing episodes once a week, every Wednesday we released an episode and it did so well for us. It's so, nice. so well for us. And if, if you look back then you'd be like, wow, Will, you sucked. Yeah. You, it's almost laughable. And I think everybody starts that way. You just got to start somewhere. See, I have my fancy headphones and uh, yeah. they're so bloody uncomfortable that I just, put music. <laughs> just it's so much. Well, it's also helpful too. like sometimes, you know, like the, the podcast mic, sorry, this is getting technical, but you like not like being able to hear yourself and how loud you are is also really helpful too. So I found that, but again, yeah, back to the point is like, it starts. Simple. And so this is the same way with virtual events start simple. It seems overwhelming, but the best thing you can do is go in with the right intentions and be consistent as you do it. Um, and what you'll find is if you give a really great presentation at one conference, someone's going to hear about how well you did and then ask you to do another one. And before you know it, your title of your LinkedIn is the guy you see speaking everywhere about the future of events. And you literally feel like you almost are a prof half professional speaker as well as a CEO of a company. And it, it just happens over time, but it's not overnight. And it's about little small conceited efforts and having the right intentions. So consistency, digital marketing content give it away all of that so i, I want to make one final question off of this and we're going to go rapid fire off of a couple of, okay so it. here's my other thing having done training um virtually having done training in person two different styles but you said something that scares me because i try to do this hybrid training and that was mm. like a disaster because oh you can gosh. engage one person one way and hybrid another way or uh, online another way so how in the world do you hold up in per or how, how do you do a hybrid event for goodness sakes <laughs> totally totally well the first thing that you have to do when it comes to a hybrid event uh, as strategy is not to uh alienate each audience right it's really easy to plan a hybrid event and focus just on in person just as equally as easy just to focus only on virtual. But you need to recognize that you need to be trying to blend the audiences together and giving them equal value. The second thing that's helpful is recognizing that everything you do doesn't translate perfectly on either side, right? So for example, um, you know, if you're going and deciding, hey, I wanna like be super engaging and you know, all these things like that, that you know, if you're only making eye contact with the in-person audience, you might be alienating the virtual audience. So the last little bit, I think, uh, and there's lots of strategies, 
if you really want to do this the right way, by the way, feel free to reach out to us. This is what we do for a living. Uh, <laughs> but when it comes to hybrid events, um, I think one of the biggest things that people make a mistake in trying to do is trying to focus too much on the in-person and just hoping that the virtual audience will attack on and be a part of it. So the biggest tip that I give to speakers, to people planning events is prioritize virtual and the in-person people are just happy to be in the same room with each other, especially right now. I mean, we're talking 2021, people are excited to be back in person. And what's funny is I've been seeing probably six, seven, six or so concerts, for example, in the last uh, you know couple months since the vaccines rolled out. And I can tell you every time I go to it, I'm expecting people to be kind of back to normal, but the artist always asks one question, which is how many people is this their first concert back? It blows my mind how many people cheer every single time. And I've been going to concerts now like three, four months in a row. I thought everyone had been to a concert at this yeah. point. People are just happy to go back to the original. So in the short term, focus on the virtual because those are the people that you need that are going to feel alienated well, then, yeah. and they're the hardest to plan for. And then the in-person people will just kind of solve itself in some ways. And then I think one big thing too is that when it comes to, you know, when you're presenting, for example, like I've had to do a couple hybrid presentations. You know, A, please, hopefully the planner setting you up for success, giving you multiple cameras with lights that tell you which camera to look at, but make eye contact with the virtual audience. Someone in the audience, you ever notice in an in-person speaking engagement, no one ever complains that like, he didn't make eye contact with me, one single person. But when you're virtual and you don't make eye contact with the camera, you're alienating tens, of thousands of people, whatever it is, the number of people attending. And so I think one of the best things you can do is look at the virtual audience and the in-person audience. As long as you're speaking in their direction, scanning, you know, every once in a while you can don't have to like just stare at the camera. You can literally like glance over at the room, but then make eye contact with the camera as much as possible. And it can be really, really powerful. Um, and so I think that's one thing. And it's a lot of... Um, I know it, 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 the question you asked, by the way, is really complex because I just realized I'm like, I basically need to explain how we do everything that we do. But I think, <laughs> uh, the, the big part of it, too, is also intentionality as you do things, too. And another tip I would have around that is just be intentional with how you're going to do things. Think about how this is going to affect the in-person, a virtual, virtual audience. And then one last tip I'll give for us. I just realized I was like, man, I could give like a whole presentation just on this alone is um, when it comes to hybrid. Just don't events, gate it for me. So just get yeah. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Well, it's going to be gated by you having to work with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, one one thing I think I would recommend uh, when it comes to this is make sure that you have an adequate team to be able to handle this too. If you have someone who is planning an event or things like that, it's not easy to do with one single person, right? So, for example, if you're a presenter going out there and doing a hybrid presentation, if you are not good at being able to look at the chat while looking at the camera and then gauging the in-person and bouncing back and forth and all and manage this juggling act, well, maybe you need to have someone on your team who's in the chat, who's engaging, who's dropping links, who's you know, you know, know, chatting with people and getting them engaged. Just in the same way that if you're planning an event, you're going to have a team who's working on the in-person element and also the virtual element. Because I've seen a big mistake happen is that everyone's like, we have our single planner. They're going to plan everything. And then what happens is they get on site, things start happening in the in-person, and it's almost like out of sight, out of mind with the virtual audience. Right. And that's really, really scary to think about. So don't let them be out of sight, out of mind, and find ways that you can add the intentionality behind it and find ways that you can consistently prioritize the virtual audience because they're the easiest ones, by the way, who can just walk out the room, go turn on Netflix, go walk the dog. But an in-person audience, to engage them, it's a lot easier. Yeah, yeah very much so. Okay, that was, that was great and tons of content there. So, um, all right. There are so many other things that I can do, but looking at the time, let's let's wind it down here. Okay, so um, what would you see? So rapid fire. I need a I need an intro. So whenever I get big and fancy like you, I'll, I'll put like segments in here. Rapid fire. Yeah. All right. So here are the rapid fires. Um, in looking at these virtual events, what would you say the biggest mistakes that you've seen your clients make, um, or before they engage you? What were some of the biggest mistakes that they made here? Biggest mistake I'm seeing right now is expecting to do what you did in 2019 to get to do it again ever. Because everybody's thinking, oh yeah, we're going back to in-person. We're going to do it. Like even some people are like, I'm going to, you know, not do a hybrid event. I'm just going to do just an in-person event. I'm like, cool. You just alienated that entire audience who loves your virtual events now or wants to not go to physical events anymore. They're gone. They're going to see that you're not doing a hybrid event or a virtual event. And they're going to go, yep, you know what? I'll go spend my money at another conference. 
So that's the first thing is I think absolutely expecting to do the exact same thing that you don't. That's the biggest mistake that I see or people who are like, yeah, we're going to get like the same speakers or, or we're going to get the, you know, same kind of content or our events going to be the exact same. Hours, going to be the same hotels. Everything has changed in the last year since March, 2020, everything has changed. And I mean, I'll make a prediction for anybody who's listening to this in 2030. I bet you things are going to be continuing to change moving forward. Not only has the events changed, your attendees have changed and you have changed. And I think everyone just kind of forgets about that, that we have been locked in our houses for a year. <laughs> we have new hobbies. We have, you know, new desires. We have new goals in life. I was originally a massive traveler. I was on a plane every single day. I was traveling the world. I loved, you know, remote working in you know, Ireland, for example. And now I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll go on one trip a year, two trips a year again. I really enjoy not, I, I know buying a car because I couldn't Uber everywhere and I was living downtown, but I'm like, I enjoy getting in my car and just going and listening to music. I've changed, right? And you've changed too. So don't expect that your attendees haven't changed and expecting that the event that you did in 2019 can work for that new audience that has changed. So that's the biggest mistake doing the same thing. So let me, let me throw it out in the future. What do you see coming down the pike that, you know, not let's, don't think about 2030, but what's happening in 2023, 2025, what trends are you seeing coming down the pike that you're either like, yay, let's get it or holy crap, let's. For sure. So I think the first thing I think when it comes to events um, and the way that we're doing things is everything's going to be moving in this hybrid manner. So right now, I think people are kind of resisting it, right? It's expensive. It's complex. Not everyone's mastered it. There's a lot of potential uh, things that could go wrong. There's a lot of reasons why people wouldn't want to do it, which is understandable, right? But the thing is about in the future is I definitely see it in the future where we're going to have these hybrid wor world that we live in. You're going to go to a conference and you might be there in person. And when you walk out of the room and you're like, oh, hey, I have a meeting request with Brian. But Brian's virtual. It's not going to feel like weird and oh, Brian's a part of the virtual. I don't. I don't want to meet people in person. You're gonna be like, oh, cool. Let's meet. Let's meet Brian. I'm really comfortable with video chat. You hop in a room, boom, Brian. You pop up on chat. And it'll be like almost like as if we were talking at the Starbucks at the convention center, and we get a chance to meet. We network and talk and everything like that. And then you know our call gets done, screen turns off, you walk out, and bam, you're back in person. But you got to do that entire experience from your pajamas and your home and everything like that. That is definitely one of the big trends is this hybrid world is going to continue to go and every technology company is pushing towards this idea. That's I think the incredible. Second, and the, the is second. that already available? Uh, kind of. We're, 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 we're getting there. We're almost <laughs> there. Uh, you know, it, it, it's basically there. Um, the problem is it's kind of cost prohibitive for you to be able to do it immediately. Okay. And I'd say most clients right now are just trying to figure out how to like, how do they deal with the reeling costs of in-person period right. um, and plus having a virtual audience. But I think the second everyone kind of starts breathing and relaxing and being like, yep, this is going to cost a little bit more money to do this right. I think everything will start to get there. And you see technologies, for example, Google, oh, I forget what it's called, but their last uh, keynote, they talked about this video software they use that people sat across from and they felt like the person was in the room with them. Oh, That's how good that kind of like a uh, video chat quality is going to start to get. I think we're almost there. Um, so I think the second piece of it is that in the future, remote work is king. So when it comes to events, you need to design your events around remote work and what that's going to look like. Um, I can't tell you, I've obviously been remote working for like eight years or a bazillion years it has been since then. And how many times that like, I was like, oh, I got to take a meeting. And I'm like, well, I can't take it from the, the, the lobby. It's too loud. Or there's not good Wi-Fi. I can't take it from the zipper hall. It's too loud or whatever. And I end up having to go all the way back to my hotel room and, you know, I'm disconnected from the entire event. In the future, we need to design our events to allow people to remote work while also attending our events. So I think that's one of the biggest, uh, biggest future trends too. And that remote tr work is never going to go away ever. I can tell you because I luckily had a little bit of foresight a couple of years ago, a little lucky that I decided remote work was the way we want to do things, but it's not going to go away. You see it with how much resistance you're getting and how much majority of people are saying, I want remote work all day long. Absolutely. And then the, the last little trend that I think that we'll start to see is that people, as much as we do have remote work, as much as we you know, have the ability to attend virtual events, there is going to be always that option that people want that in-person element. But the most important thing is people are going to be way more picky about the quality of things. Now that people have um, realized that they can don't have to go to a movie cinema, they can watch high quality video at their home. They bought and they invested in the $2,000 OLED TV so they can have a home theater experience, right? They're realizing that, man, like 
I can do all these sort of things and enjoy content, but every once in a while I want to go and invest in an in-person experience. But they're saying to themselves, I don't have to. So what's going to happen is, you know, I don't know about everybody else that's listening to this, but we, I used to go to a lot of conferences. I was speaking at a lot of conferences. I was attending a lot of conferences, love to travel and things like that. But now I'm way more picky. I'm probably going to pick one. In fact, I think I'm only attending – or I think I'm going to be speaking at it anyways, but I, I chose to only go to one conference this year in our industry. It's called IMAX, and it's like the biggest show. It's three hours away. I know that I can get in there, go do, go to the conference, and then get out. But you know, if someone was saying to me, hey, are you going to go to XYZ conference? And I won't shame anybody, but I was probably saying, you know, to be honest, if I'm not speaking, I'm just not going to go yeah. because – I, I, I'm not going to enjoy the con I can get the content at home. I, uh, you know, have, I'd rather stay focused on the business. Um, and I, I have that kind of a, allowance now. I don't feel that I need to have FOMO when I can just attend from virtually as well. And then here's the biggest trend that people have to be afraid of is that if you then decide to only do an in-person element and you don't offer me the ability to attend virtually, I'm gone. I, yeah. I won't care anymore. And I think that we have to really be cognizant of that in the future. So that um, hybrid really, really has to be top of mind for folks. Now, you threw out a term that a lot of people won't be familiar with, FOMO. Can you define what that is? <laughs> yeah, for sure. FOMO is the fear of missing out. Um, it was very big, a big trend in like, how do we design our events to make people fear FOMO? Uh, and it's funny, when you think about designing in-person and uh, virtual audiences, you don't want to create FOMO of one either audience, right? And, you know, what's interesting is that now I think, uh, and Nick Borelli gets shout out for this one, is he talks about like, how do you design your events instead with JOMO, the joy of missing out? Right? <laughs> um, and I think that now people are just, they're overwhelmed with all the things going on. And especially in this transition that you have people who are still not very, very technologically the most advanced people in the entire world. I got you guys, you don't worry. Um, but you know, you have to be recognized that there's going to be a lot of, you don't want to create that FOMO <laughs> too, too much, but instead create this experience where people are going to feel like, yes, this is the one conference I'm going to invest in. This is a, I'm sorry, I know I'm just piling on trends. So it's the end of the year. So I'm starting to plan for what the trends are for next year. But the next thing I think is that people also want to spend more money with higher quality experiences. People aren't looking to have 20 Chick-fil-A kind of experiences. They want to go to the one nice steak restaurant to get that chicken, it's amazing chicken sandwich. That was a terrible example, but you guys get what I'm trying to say is that people want to have really high quality experiences. And I see a big future trend that people are going to spend more money to get those high quality experiences and do less experiences. And it's going to become quality over quantity. Interesting. Okay. Love that. Now let, let's switch this up completely different. Best business, <laughs> best business hack. And, and that can be around mm -hmm. talent, how you're hiring talent, sales what are you doing to drive sales or scaling your business you had a small little growth spurt of 250 to 300 <laughs> percent so uh, one one hack off of one of those three please yeah aside from like all the content marketing stuff i've outlined right um i think one of the the best con what's the best business i'm thinking like in a true like hacky kind of way um what's funny is that my team very much pushes me now to be like uh, i have to slow down in a lot of ways because now we have way more employees so if will's like hey let's change our software to do this like that can be really <laughs> dangerous for the business so i have to be like way slower so i'm trying to think like what's the most recent hack that i've I, i've kind of seen um Damn, it used to be remote work too. Um, you know, I think when it comes to hacks, I think designing it where you're, you're, uh, you are working at everything you can to be the leader in the space that you're trying to do is the first kind of like narrow way to kind of do this. But here's the best hack that I have is that don't hesitate to have a controversial opinion within your industry. We all have one. We all have that thing that, you know, we, we want to say, but we don't say it because we might like make someone angry. And it started with me even when we were just barely starting our content game that like I preached that the events industry need to stop using 1099 contractors for everything and that they need to start using W2 and that eventually the government's going to realize the events industry. Um, this is why I talk too much about it. It's going to draw so much attention to it. But in the events industry, everyone 1099s and instead of W2s and because it's a contractor world and everyone works for everybody and everybody, you know, and I was like, that's dangerous. And what's funny is like I predicted, I was like, in the future, the government's going to see this and be like gold mine, back pay, back fees, all these things like that. And I said this and it was extremely controversial because I basically just told 90% of companies that their staffing model is broken and that it's bad. And I got so much, like the comments were so great. I, people hated it, <laughs> but it drew so much attention. It was like one of our highest traffic blogs ever. 
Yeah. Then I then I like, you know, for example, recently I've been saying things like, hey, but instead of hiring a hotel and having this gigantic catering budget and um, trying to, um, you know, find a way to get all your attendees to come and eat all the food that you're going to do. And the reason why people do this is that when you get have gigantic catering budgets with the hotels, they give you discounts on the rooms. They give you sometimes discounts on the AV and it becomes this kind of like self-fulfilling, uh, like cohesive relationship. What's the like when a a tick is on your back, right? It's like a symbiotic. symbiotic. Yeah, symbiotic. That's the word I'm looking for. And so what's funny is that like this is a very traditional thing. It's just like give a lot of money to the catering. Catering's like your second biggest line item after AV. So I started saying to people, I was like, when you go back to your events to go back to the things aren't the same way, I tell people, I say, hey, instead of doing it that way, why don't we just give a three-hour break for events? And we say – there's no catering at the hotel. You got to go out and actually go get the food yourself. You got to go to the restaurants. You got to pay for it on your own, everything like that. And what I real, uh, the reason I said is because like, I don't remember the last time I ate hotel catering. I always just take a client, take an employee, and I go off site because I want to enjoy local food. I want to support the local businesses. And I also don't need more hotel food in my life. And that might be because I eat so much, I have eaten so much of it. But what I realized is like that would save companies 30, 40% off their entire event budget instantly. Yeah. But what it is, is that it's changing the status quo. And I realized that I just pissed off an entire industry of hotel people by saying this. I've never gotten a death threat. I've never gotten, you know, and the, when I say those angry messages, you know, it's somebody like writing a sternly worded thing saying you're wrong and things like that. It hurts your ego a little bit, but it's never been that bad. But I've always gotten more attention from being a little controversial. I'll pair this, though, with because there's a, there's people who I've seen do this and it frustrates me. It doesn't mean you have to be controversial all the time. Right. <laughs> you can have a couple controversial opinions, but you can't be that person who's trying to always stir the pot by posting on LinkedIn and saying, you know, unpopular opinion. I think remote work sucks, you know, and, and then you're just doing it just to cause comments and likes. No, that's not productive. What I'm trying to say is like, look, take something fundamental that you thought you had to do for an event and do something differently. And I think that's one of the best business hacks that you can have is Every time that I've suggested that, it starts great conversation. It gets people thinking, and they think, wow, Will thinks differently. And he's not saying the same thing that everybody else is saying. Yeah, it's having that authentic voice and, and being different. That's that's how you stand out. Those are your differentiators. Love it. Now, how do we get as smart as you? I mean, what uh, resources might you recommend, whether books, podcasts? How do we do that? Um, yeah, I read, I read a lot. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I listen to a little bit of everything. Um, one of my favorite new features is that, uh, you know, especially now that I have a team who can specialize in every area, but, uh, Spotify has this playlist called daily drive. It mixes in short podcasts in with your favorite music. I struggle that I love music, but I also want to catch up on, you know, news and financial news and things like that. So that's one of my favorite resources that I love very much called daily drive. It's in your for me, for you section. So that was an easy one that popped to the top of my head. Um, another resource that I really love, and I can't like just say like, this is the book or blog I read and it changed my life, right? There's a couple of those, but one of my favorite resources is an app called Feedly. Uh, it's an RSS reader. It allows you to take, you know, for example, the 15 different blogs that you read or news sources, put them all in one single place and you can just scroll through them. And then one of the things I do is I have it set that whenever I scroll through the headlines, it marks it as read. So when I my goal is to get through it and I read headlines, try to find the stuff that's interesting, see what's going on. If I like something, then I do a kind of a one-two punch and I use an app called Pocket, which I save it to. I don't read it right then usually unless it's something I'm like, oh, I can I really want to know about this right now. But I save it and I come back to it later. And Pocket's great because it saves it for offline. It makes it, it gets rid of all the ads and all the images so it makes it a clean reading experience. And I love that so much. Now, here's the newest tip and resource that I love. It's called Readwise. Readwise takes all your highlights from Kindle, Feedly, Pocket, wherever you use to highlight things and save like quotes that you love, even in the web browser. And it serves them up and puts them in a database. And every day it serves you five of those highlights. Oh, and what's wow. so great about this is that it, it takes those all those articles you've read, those quotes that you love, and reserves them back to help you memorize them and learn them so then you can come back to it. And one of my favorite things to do is they have this great share feature that turns the quote into like a great image with a book cover or the blog post. And I like sharing them back to my team. So it helps me then create that culture of sharing. And so um, it allows me to then gather lots and lots of information and cover so much without, um, you know, feeling of overwhelm and having clocked different blogs and also to actually act upon it. I will admit, I don't read every article in my pocket. I probably have tens of thousands of articles. There's probably like 80% of them I haven't read, but I've saved them. So eventually if I'm sitting on a plane and I'm like, I got nothing to do. I don't want to read a book that, you know, or whatever it is. I'm like, 
let me open my pocket or if I'm on the toilet real quick, I can read a quick article. Um, and that's been really, really helpful for me. Um, and yeah, so I think that's kind of my, like my triple punch start feedly, put all your blog posts, blogs in there. And if the blog starts not serving you well and the content sucks, get it out of your feed, save it to pocket and then use Readwise to rediscover it as well. Smart. And, and that's really that little hack there allows you to, to take what you've learned to make application. I say it all the time. It, it's not, 100%. what do I know, but what am I going to do about what I just learned? So that is so critically important. It's, it's all about application. So my gosh, Will, I knew this would be a lot of fun. I knew you'd be high energy. You dropped it all <laughs> over the place. Awesome. <laughs> say, so let me wind it down. Who should reach out to you? How should they do it? And why should people reach out to you? Totally. Yeah. If, if, if you are doing events in any sort of way, or you have a budget for events, please feel free to reach out to Endless. HelloEndless.com. If, or if you're just doing events, honestly, I'm not even going to make the hard ask of saying reach out and to work with us. Just go to our site and get all of our resources. It's free. We give away the farm all day long. If you want to learn how to produce an in-person event, uh, in -person event, virtual event, hybrid event, all that information is on our blog, on our eBooks, webinars, all that stuff. Take it, take it, take it. And if you like what we talk about, then go for a reach, work with us. Um, and then if anyone ever wants to reach out to me as well, you can just go to willcurran.com. My links to all my social media uh, is on there. It also has information about like what my favorite movies are, what my favorite music is, information about the podcast that I'm on. It's just kind of cool, like one pager on there as well. But feel free to reach out to me any single time. I read all my LinkedIn messages. That's probably one of the easiest ways to like cold way you're in. I think Brian, that's how we actually met. Was through, uh, was through LinkedIn. So don't hesitate to LinkedIn message me. That's probably one of the best ways to reach into me. I apologize if it takes me like maybe a couple days to get back or every once in a while I get like a flood of messages. <laughs> it might take me like I'm, I'm catching up on 2020 messages from all the like the people looking for virtual help still, but um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to help. Nice. Well, I really appreciate your time here. It's been a lot of fun great content, learned a bunch myself. And uh, boy, I, I love that. So thanks so very much. Hey, on, on behalf of Will Kern, uh, you know, get out there, do something, reach out to helloendless.com and uh, take advantage of Will's kindness, like download some stuff and do some fun stuff, put out some good content and forward it to Will and Nathan. So, hey, thanks so much, everyone. Get after it.